Turning 60 marks the beginning of a decade that many people enjoy. It's also an important time to begin revisiting key decisions around retirement as retirement draws near. Some of those key decisions are what funding sources to use to pay your expenses in retirement. And even if you're high net worth, you want to be thoughtful about when you start taking Social Security to maximize the benefit. The 60s are also an opportune time to revisit your estate plan and make decisions about what areas to update. We'll talk about these and other topics today with financial planning expert Jody King. Jody's the vice president and director of financial planning at Fiduciary Trust. And I'm also joined by John Morey. He's head of client service and business development at Fiduciary Trust, who will lead the discussion with Jody. Over to you, John. Thank you, Todd. It's wonderful to be here with you, Jody, to discuss such an important topic. Let's start with retirement. For people in their 60s who are nearing retirement or in retirement, there are many things to consider. Um, What are some of the key questions they should be asking? Thank you, John. At the very beginning, when do they plan to retire? Are they already retired? Are they wanting to continue working for how many more years? Begin with that question. and Then after that, start to think about what's retirement going to look like for them? Are they going to continue working part time? Are they going to, they have hobbies are going to fill their time? Will they be golfing? You know, what exactly will the activities look like? And how will their, what will their life look like as they go through their retirement years? And then where do they want to live? Mm. You know, do they want to live in the warm climate, in the colder climate? Do they want to be near family? If they have any health or mobility concerns, they should obviously take that into account. But basically they need to start to picture how their life would be and then start to think about, you know, how they're going to meet those goals along the way. An important component I think that people sometimes overlook is income. Mm-hmm. So income, uh, earned income through their entire life is important, but now that income goes away and they have to rely on their savings and their retirement accounts. How would you advise people to, to deal with that? You know, that's a big mind shift because you've been accumulating assets all during your working years. And now you're kind of shifting from that phase where you have that steady stream of employment income coming into mm-hmm. relying on your nest egg. And if you have a sound financial plan, you should be comfortable doing that because you should know exactly what's available to you and what's how you can work with that in the best way. So what they need to do is just kind of start to think about the fact it's okay to start to spend that. What I find a lot of people feeling most comfortable with is you know a monthly amount being deposited in their checking account, almost like their paycheck, if you will. But it kind of helps them to budget and helps them to understand what the cash flow is going to look like. And, and then again, like I said, if it's part of a sound financial plan, they can feel comfortable with working with that and using those assets, as well as Social Security and some of the other income sources that might be out there for them. So speaking of Social Security, um, a high net worth individual may not rely on Social Security, um, but they still have to take it. People still have to take it. How do you advise people to handle Social Security? Absolutely. And Social Security is very important. People paid into the system, they want to take the benefit. Um, your full retirement age, you have a full retirement age in the Social Security system that's based on your year of birth. So depending on that, um, it will depend on how your benefit is calculated exactly. You can take a benefit as early as age 62. If, you, if your full retirement age is 67 and you take a benefit at 62, your benefit will be decreased by 30% per month for, the life, for your lifetime. The other option is you can wait and take Social Security at a later date. So you can wait beyond your full retirement age and actually receive delayed retirement credits for that. So if you wait till age 70 and your full retirement age is age 67, you can receive up to 24% per month higher in benefit amount. And again, that continues for the duration of your lifetime. And if you have a surviving spouse, they will step into your shoes and receive that higher benefit than for their ongoing lifetime. So there can be a lot of reasons to to defer. There can be a lot of reasons to take it at 62. It really depends on your situation, your health status, what your income needs are, you know, and just different factors when you look at your overall portfolio and how your financial plan fits together. Um, Another source of income in retirement are IRAs, traditional IRAs. Can you talk a little bit about the the requirements around withdrawing from an IRA and maybe some of the penalties if, if not withdrawing in time from an IRA? You can begin taking assets from your IRA as early as age 59 and a half and not have to pay a penalty. Whenever you do take assets from your IRA, it will generally be taxable as ordinary income. You can delay taking assets from your traditional IRA until your required beginning date. For those turning 70 and a half before December 31st, 2019, their required beginning date is age 70 and a half. For someone who turns 70 and a half after that date, 
then their required beginning date is age 72. Once you reach your required beginning date, you must begin taking distributions from your traditional IRA and they're called required minimum distributions. And those are calculated based on your life expectancy. Usually distributions from your traditional IRA will be taxed as ordinary income. Okay. Would investors and retirees in this case have the ability to make a charitable contribution from their IRA? Absolutely. Once you reach, reach age 70 and a half, you can make a, what they call a qualified charitable distribution to a charity from your IRA in any given year, each year, for up, of up to $100,000. And that amount will count as part of your required minimum distribution, but will not be taxed as ordinary income. Okay. So if you have charitable ambitions and you want to make charitable contributions, it can be a wonderful way to satisfy those desires. Terrific. So we, we focused on traditional IRAs. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about a Roth IRA and what, what the differences might be um, in using that income in retirement. So a Roth IRA is different in the fact that it's not tax deferred, it's tax free because you've already paid the tax as the assets went into the IRA, Roth IRA. And so there are no required minimum distributions from a Roth IRA. There are, however, from a Roth 401k, but there are no required minimum distributions. So that's really a fabulous asset to pass on to the next generation because you're giving them an asset that doesn't have any income tax consequences when they inherit that. Okay. So, so to sum it up, there, there are a lot of opportunities to take from retirement accounts, pension plans, savings, investments. How would you prioritize or what, what's the hierarchy of when to take and what to take in all those different uh, funding sources? So once you make your decision about when you're going to take Social Security, based on all the other factors, obviously that would be number would be a source. Mm -hmm. If you have, have a pension available to you, you're going to want to make a decision about whether that's a you're taking on just your lifetime or whether you're having a survivorship benefit for a spouse. And then that's a terrific source. And then after that, you're going to start probably taking from your IRA assets, your traditional IRA assets, mm -hmm. you know, at least up until the amount of your required minimum distribution. And then after that, probably turning to your traditional investment assets. So up to this point, we've talked about, we've talked about income, right? In replacing your earned income with your savings and other, other means in retirement. Let's talk a little bit about the expense side of things, in particular healthcare. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a concern for everybody, both where to find it and the cost of healthcare. And Medicare is a big part of that. Can you talk a little bit about um, when to take Medicare and when to find supplemental care and how um, in retirement? You become eligible for Medicare at age 65, and most people want to go ahead and take Medicare at age 65, because if you delay and don't have appropriate creditable coverage, when you're delaying, you can end up paying a penalty of up to 10% per year for every year you don't have that coverage. If you have a spouse that is continuing to work, and so they're receiving health benefits through their employer, and it's an employer with more than 20 employees, then you can end up with that counting as creditable coverage. You can delay Medicare if you choose to. Without the penalty. Without the penalty. Right. Um, the thing to be aware of is if you have a spouse working for a small employer, you'll have coverage from that plan, but Medicare may actually be um, primary to the coverage based on the contracts with the insurance company. So if you don't elect Medicare, the insurance company is going to say Medicare is primary for you. This is when you have a small employer, mm -hmm. just the, the way the laws are written. So you have to be very careful and you should always check with the HR personnel at you or your spouse's employer to make sure that you have credible coverage and understand what those coverages are because otherwise you can get caught and that can be uncomfortable. So when working for a small company under 20 employees, pay particular attention to the benefits. Absolutely, okay. pay particular good, attention. Good. And Medicare, there's different parts to it. Part A is the traditional hospital coverage. There's generally no cost to electing that. Part B is kind of the outpatient services, the doctor visits, that type of coverage. And there is a cost to electing that. Um, part C isn't as common in this part of area of the country, but Part D is prescription drug coverages, and there's a cost to electing that. And usually what people do in addition to the Medicare costs, they'll have a, um, a coverage, a private insurance coverage that they lay over the top of that, and that will provide them with kind of a more traditional, robust insurance coverage that they were used to during their working years. Okay, very helpful. Along the same lines with insurance in general, Medicare is a form of insurance. What other types of insurance um, in particular, long-term care or life insurance, should someone in their 60s be considering? So at your 60s, when you're thinking about retirement, it's a 
great time to step back and say, what are my coverages and are they appropriate? So do I have life insurance? Do I have too much life insurance? Do I have not enough life insurance? Do I have the right types of life insurance? And if you have any type of whole life or universal policy, check in on how it's been performing and make sure it's going to be there when you expect it to be. If you're interested in long-term care insurance and if you don't already have it, then it's a great time to think about checking into that, those coverages. And the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets, the harder it can be to get if you have health concerns kind of pop in along the way. So it's a really a good time to just kind of do that overall insurance check. Speaking along the same lines of taking a step back and, and looking at what you have, let's talk about estate planning. Mm. So estate planning, I would imagine most people in their 60s have done some sort of estate planning, but is it a good time in your 60s to look at that and update it? And what are the, some of the things or the key areas you'd really want to look at in your estate plan? And so it is a great time to look at your estate plan and hopefully that you've done your estate plan by that point, but whether you have or not, it's a good time to revisit what you have. So you should be thinking about as you, as you, your children of age, as your grandchildren might have aged and you've gotten to know who they are, are the terms of your estate plan based on your wealth and your goals, are they appropriate? You should revisit whether the appropriate parties are named in your estate plan. So not only who's going to be receiving the assets, but do you have the right executor or personal representative in place? Do you have the right trustees in place? Do you have the right person named in your healthcare proxy? Have you actually communicated with those people about what your wishes are? Those conversations are extremely important. And then take a look at your durable power of attorney and make sure that the right parties are named in that as well. Okay. So at what point and to what level do you bring your children into the discussion about estate planning? So that's a really good question, John, because I think it's very individualized by family about when the right time is to have those discussions mm -hmm. and also about what level to have those discussions. It's important to make sure that the next generation is ready for the wealth and that they're ready to step into the roles you want them to. Mm -hmm. And so having those discussions sooner than you're probably ready to have them is important and may depend on your level of wealth as far as exactly how you disclose that and what type of information is involved in those discussions. Okay, very helpful. So let's talk a little bit about care and support. Mm -hmm. um, most people in their 60s are healthy enough to live independently. However, as they approach their late 60s, they may be um, considering where to live and, 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 and what conditions they live in. How does one think about that, determining where to live as they, as they begin to age? You know, I think that as people begin to age, it is a very appropriate time to think about where they want to live out the rest of their life. And, you know, sometimes it's they'll have multiple homes. Sometimes they're picking one location. Do they want to be in Florida now? Do they want to be in you know, northeast? Where do they want to be? And so having discussions and thinking about how you would picture your life going in those various locations. Do you want to be near family? Do you want to be in a warmer climate? And making those decisions along the way. And then thinking about if things don't go maybe as what you know, if I'm not as healthy when I'm 85 as I am today, what's important to me? Do I want to live in a continuous care community? Do I want to be bringing help into my home? Does it matter then how close I am to family? So just kind of starting to think about some of those things and having those discussions with family members becomes very important. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a lot of major topics today. We've talked about where to live. We've talked about how to spend. We've talked about healthcare and Medicare. So are there other tips you would recommend for um, people to protect their financial assets in retirement? Absolutely. In addition to making sure the right parties are named to help them out along the way, it's a good idea if you haven't already frozen your credit to think about doing so. Pull a credit report, make sure there's nothing going on and have mm -hmm. that checked periodically. If you haven't already signed up for your My Social Security online account, you should do that now. Um, you can do that anytime, but mm. you want to do it earlier than later. And you definitely want to have that done when you're getting ready to start to claim Social Security benefits and see what your benefits may look like. Perfect. Jody, thank you. All very useful information. Are there any final thoughts? I think wealth planning is a fairly complex topic and mm. there's a lot of different factors we've talked about today. And I think it's important to um, be honest with yourself with regard to all the complexity of your situation and then rely on a professional to help you walk through that and think that through. I know with our clients, we spend a lot of time adjusting as time goes along because circumstances change. And so I really encourage people to reach out to someone that can help them, their financial advisor, to help them put together wealth plans appropriate for them and their family. Great. Thank you, Jody. That wraps up our discussion for several key factors in financial planning to consider while in your 60s. And now back to you, Todd. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the discussion useful. 
You can find access to these insights and other topics on our website at fiduciary-trust.com. I also encourage you to reach out to a fiduciary trust officer who can help you, or you can reach out to us at the contact information on the next screen. Thanks again for joining.